So last time we talked about the Nixon administration, we looked at Watergate, um, but we also want to talk about, you know, like I said, this is also the, the 70s, like I said, it's both America and crisis, it's also the rise of conservatism in America, and that includes beyond just like the Nixon administration, which like I said, the Nixon administration isn't, isn't even the most conservative administrations, it's got some fairly liberal aspects. But we also see, like I call up here, the counter, counter revolution, all right? So you had the counter revolution in the 60s, right? Where all the hippies were out and people were, you know, asking for a change in society. Here you can see those who were against the change in society. Um, this is a reaction against it. Like 1962 or 63, don't ask me the exact date. Engels versus Vitale, for example. Engel versus Vitale is the Supreme Court case, which 19, I'm pretty sure 62, is the Supreme Court case, for example, that says that, okay, I'll give you right. School-led compulsory prayer is not allowed in public schools. There we go. School-led compulsory prayer. There we go. Uh, are you allowed to pray in a public school? Yes. I mean, like, they, that's the famous joke. As long as there are math tests, there will be prayer in schools. Dear God, I didn't study. Help me. Um, you know, but school-led compulsory is no longer allowed. So things like that. Another example, now, this is, is in 1972, 73, rather, during, oh, come on. Please, Pat. Please work. Why aren't you working? Be a good little computer and do it for me. Come on. All right, let's try that again. Hopefully it's still recording like it's supposed to. 1973, the Burger Court, which is, like I said, still a more conservative court, still has this famous ruling of Roe v. Wade. Uh, 1973. Um, but yeah, uh, Supreme Court rules that restrictions on a, a woman's right to a abortion, at least in the first trimester, is unconstitutional na nationwide. Now, it doesn't mean all abortion is legal. It just means in that first trimester. And this becomes a real point of American politics. Um, on one hand, oh, by the way, Roe was not the real name of the, the, uh, the plaintiff. It was a fake name. I forget her real name. But afterwards, she became a big pro-life advocate. But then right before she died, she put out, like, she put a confession or will. Like, she didn't actually care about the pro-life movement. She just wanted to make lots of money off of it, which she did. Um, so, nice lady. All right. It's also this time to, you see the... Work for all that is good and such and such. Ah, I'm in a bad mood now. Anyway, it's just no reason for it not to do its thing, and it bugs me. All right, you see the rise of evangelicals, aka the Christian right, as American political force. Conservative religious beliefs, along with conservative political beliefs, really happens in the 1970s. And really here you can see the three waves of evangelicals in politics. I'm not going to go into a whole lot, but wave one is what we would call personal evangelism. It's not apolitical. It still can be very political, but it's not so much about politics. Best example is there. Billy Graham would be that first wave of evangelicals involvement in society. More about preaching and not really involved in direct politics. So not away from it. Billy Graham was very anti-communist. You can read some of his early, I mean, his 49th uh, L.A. Uh, uh, revival, which is where he kind of really got his start, included aspects about talking about communism as a system born from hell and the devil. But it's, for the most part, stayed out of politics. Then we get to, so you can think of Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Wave two, this starts in the 70s, where it's about political influence. Evangelicals, or the Christian right, however you want to call them, I don't really have a preference, really start to in, try to influence politics, influence voting behavior. And that's seen in people like you see up there, Jerry Farwell, Falwell, and the moral majority. Kind of becoming, and we'll talk about this next year in government, interest groups. And that's why when you look to the elections of Carter and Ronald Reagan, they're very much out of this time period reaching for that evangelical vote. Wave three, stage three, after they were disappointed with Carter and Reagan, especially Carter, and they wouldn't say so much about Reagan, but they wouldn't say it out loud. You have this idea of direct political power. Evangelicals start running for office themselves. No better example maybe than Pat Robertson, who in 1988 runs for president 
and he actually wins the Iowa caucus, which is actually pretty big. Um, you would say the election of George W. Bush is a direct example of this, where Bush runs as an evangelical candidate, George W. Bush, the elder, or the younger Bush in the year 2000. Um, so yeah, the Christian right starts to grow in power as this counter-revolution against the problems they see in society. Whether it be, now, you know, some of these guys have a bad legacy to live down. Not so much Billy Graham. Billy Graham's good about this. Follow was terrible at it, because Follow was a very strong segregationist for a long time. Um, remember, saying pretty much the idea that God loves everyone, but in their own spot. Um, but the idea of, you know, so sometimes even they say conservative values, that's going to be, you know, code for, you know, segregation. Um, there we go. But yeah, this growth in this concept, this is during the time in, in religious, we call it the Jesus movement. It's during this time, for example, um, the Calvary Chapel starts under Smith. Yeah. Um, was it seven, in 1978, 40% of Americans really emphasize that terminology of born again Christian really becomes big in the 70s. Um, I don't know why I'm doing these, but I guess because it's terminology. It means it's a term. It doesn't mean I have like, a problem with it. It's the same term. <laughs> anyway, but yeah. Uh, Carter, for example, will use the term born again for himself. You also see, starting in the 60s into the 70s, I swear to all is good and holy, I'm going to throw something at the screen, because I will, I, for, it, every time I switch a slide, it does not, and it makes me mad. And Mr. What? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, okay, what's up, man? Is the elephant the Republican? Yes. Or the elephant. Donkey. Remember, that goes back to, the donkey goes back to um, Andrew Jackson, because the idea okay. that the, remember that they were thinking in front of him, like, haha, he's a donkey, and they're like, haha, donkeys are hard workers. All right, in the 60s and 70s, you also saw the, the growth of the feminist movement. Uh, there on the left is Betty Friedan. In 1963, she wrote the book The Feminine Mystique, which was pretty much saying that it was criticized that cult of domesticity. In other words, it was criticizing the housewife mentality of 1950s women and pretty much saying, yeah, they're all there, and guess what? They're all miserable. Um, it also called for you know women's greater rights, and we saw some of these aspects already. Um, you saw the the women, you know, the Title IX, some of her of action. Um, there was also, a, you know, movements towards equal pay. One of the big things at this time, though, was the ERA, or the Equal Rights Amendment. There was an attempt to amend the Constitution, which said, Section 1 is the only one you really need to care about. Section 1 of this new amendment to the Constitution would say, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So it was a clear statement in the Constitution, men and women would have equality of sexes. It will not pass. The ERA will die. It, it goes through Congress, but before it can go to Congress, it has to go to the states. The states have to pass it. It does not, partially because at this time you also have the anti-feminist movement, a backlash against feminism. And there you can see in the middle Phyllis Schlafly, who is probably the most famous member, because she said feminism is anti-family, anti-children, and pro-abortion. Which, that's something that a defendant's movement could always have a problem with, where you have this, like, really putting... Abortion could be a very dividing line between groups that could come together, and, but that's not here, there, for enough. That could be for another day. But yeah, the idea that feminism was against traditional family values. I mean, you've got different things at the time. Like, I might give you guys science. For example, you've got Helen Reddy at this time singing... You know what? Hey, why not? I might even have ready. Yeah. Let's see. Because this is the 70s. 1973, Helen Reddy wins a, a Grammy for her song, which is not on here, because I didn't look it up. Me, my bad. All right. Got to have Helen Reddy do it, too. Not, no. There we go. It's got to be a Helen Reddy. But yeah, the song is I Am Woman, right? I am woman, hear me roar. I am strong. I am invincible. I am woman. Which sounds really funny coming for me. But, uh, you know, she famously at the Grammys, thanks God. He's like, I want to thank God for this award and all she's done for me, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, but then you have this at the same time. And you've got this backlash against it. Famously, Phyllis Shaffley, like, does it on purpose. She goes to a... She goes to an event, she's like, I want to thank my husband for allowing me to speak here today. Just to pee people off. It worked. Um, but the ERA does kill, it gets killed in 1982. It will not be ratified. Three it's three states short. There it is. I am invincible. I am woman. All right, there we go. Um, 
Have you ever seen the old uh, Peace Dragon from the 70s? That's the lady that takes care of him. Yeah, I hate it too, actually. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's the one that takes care of him. My sister loved that movie. I, I hated it. I, you know, as a kid, I watched it, but I didn't like it then either. You, how many of you had that as a kid? There was a movie you watched as a kid, and you really didn't like it then. But for some reason, you kept watching it. Yeah. <laughs> it just happens. All right. So, yeah. So, you've got this culture. You're starting to see what's going to really dominate American history for the next 50 years. And it only, or 40, 50 years, it only gets worse after the Cold War ends, this cultural divide. Because at least back then, we all agreed on one thing. Darn those commies. So let's, you know, before we get back into politics, let's talk about the 70s. The 70s, or as I call this subtitle, man, this decade mostly sucks. This is not exactly America's shining moment of a decade, all right? First of all, in terms of the economy, it does something that, according to economists, is impossible. The economy stagnates, but yet there's still inflation. According to economists, this cannot happen. But one thing you learn about from me when you teach economics is economists get things long a lot, but they're okay with that because their models look good. But yeah, the prices were rising, but unemployment was up. The, the, the GDP was not growing. People weren't buying things, which makes no sense. Prices are going up, yet no one wanted to buy anything. Kind of this weird situation. You might be thinking, is that like now? No, right now it's just inflation. The economy is still growing. Unemployment's not up. Um, it's just prices are getting expensive. But yeah, uh, there were various attempts. But um, in 1970, 6% of the employment was, un was uh, unemployed. In 1971, inflation reached a rate of 12%, which... That's even worse than it is today. This, right now, inflation's the worst it's been in about 40 years, since like the early 1980s. But yeah, uh, unemployment continued to rise. By uh, 75, it was over 9%. But yeah, you had a go economies that weren't running. The government was in massive debt from both the Great Society and the Vietnam War. Uh, at this point, uh, Germany and Japan have really risen as economic powerhouses and are creating uh, competition for, uh, in the international market for various goods. Uh, prices are going up uh, in terms of energy, which we're going to look at in a moment. But yeah, it's a, it was hit rough. Indeed, on that note, this was the energy crisis in the 1970s. To what you're going, ha, <laughs> been there. But yeah, no, oil was up. Part of the reason was because there was an embargo. Does anyone know what OPEC is? It's okay if you don't. OPEC is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Russia, Venezuela, and pretty much the Middle East. All right? These are Middle these are countries. In 1973, they, the Arab countries stopped sending oil to primarily the United States, but pretty much all the Western nations, because they supported Israel during the Yom Kippur War of 1973, which some of you might remember from last year, the, this, the, the Yom Kippur War. But that included Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, Iran. And so the price of oil went from about $3 a barrel. <laughs> it used to be $3 a barrel. Uh, $3 a barrel to eleven sixty-five a barrel, which is a really big jump. Um, if you're wondering, like, what's gas right now? Well, technically oil prices, it's not about that anymore because the price of a gallon of oil, or a barrel of oil is um, it's actually cheap, the cheapest it's been in about like five years at this point because it went back down. That's why gas prices are going down. <clears throat> anyway, um, <laughs> spoiler alert, they are not. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, but yeah, gas prices doubled. Inflation shot above ten percent. People, and this is where you, and this is a problem too. This is the seventies. Yeah. These cars get like oh, gallons. Bro. They get oh, gallons per bro. mile. All right, you know, they rev that engine. That's like ten bucks. You know, right now, you know. Like, I had some, like, guy in his dude bro truck, like, just drove right past me yesterday on the free, on Saturday free. I'm like, I enjoyed that. It was probably, like, 15 bucks. <laughs> Can't afford that. Anyway, so, um. It was probably my dad. I'm sorry. No, no, it was, I don't know. Yeah, it was But, yeah, the, the thing, so people are using a lot of oil. And this leads to oil shortages in the 70s. This was very common. You would have to wait in line because you might find it. Yeah, it's Costco, yeah. I love Costco, by the way, because people have this mentality that it's cheaper. If it's still, if, if it's 10 cents cheaper, if it's $5.55 and the other normal, let's say that's the normal price. That's still 10 cents a gallon. Whether or not, whether it's, you know, $1.10, let's say gas went down to that, or $1.20, $1.10, 
it's still the same savings, but yet when it's more expensive, people are like, well, I'm going to wait five hours in line and use three more gallons of gas while I idle my car. It's like, it's still 10 cents a gallon. You got to think about the per gallon. If you got a 10 gallon tank, you're only going to save a dollar no matter how much you do it. But I digress. Anyway, this time people are doing it because sometimes these are the only gas stations open. Not every gas station was open. Gas stations would run out of gas because there was an oil shortage. Uh, there was, a, like I said, this was an oil embargo. Times were tough. Um, I remember my, in parts of Orange County, I know they made rules like you could get gas only on certain days based on your license plate. Like if it ended with a certain number or letter, that's when you could get it. There was attempts to change it. Uh, for example, uh, they, they lowered the speed limit to 55 nationwide. Because that is true. If you drive slower, you will use less gas. I also might add in the 70s, we also tried to convert to the metric system. And uh, neither of these worked. So there we go. So, yeah. I want my miles at 5,280. What's this thousand stuff? Anyway, yeah. So the metric system didn't take either. Yeah. What else about the 70s was fun? Oh, yeah, the environment was trash. Good times. The environment was just real bad. Pollution was maybe at its worst. Um, you, also, you know, this is where you have the Three Mile Island incident, the worst nuclear disaster in American history. When at Three Mile Island in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, they have a radioactive, the core releases radioactive water and steam into the air, into the water. Yay! Um, it keeps going. There is some movements, or actually, what else happens? Uh, in 77, the New York City blackout happens. The entire city of New York goes dark for a few days. Because that's all New York City needs. Dark. Vengeance. That's the best thing it needs. <laughs> yeah, vengeance. <laughs> um, yeah. This Sorry, one, uh, widespread looting, activity, arson. Yeah, you know, I mean, plus, it was the sun. It was hot. There, so it was just not good. You know how bad things got? Anyone know what famously happened in, uh, this is actually in the late 60s, but still around this time period. Anyone know what happened in Ohio? The Ohio, the, in Cleveland, the Cuyahoga, the Cuyahoga, I'm gonna get say, the Cuyahoga River catches on fire. The river catches on fire. It is so polluted, it just bursts into flames. It's water. It's a river, but it's so disgusting. It burns for like days, and it costs like millions of dollars in damages. All right. Yeah, it's a different. <laughs> you know, in the t at least that's dry grass. That's, this is water. <laughs> that's the whole thing you put it out with. <laughs> I don't think they are. I think they're California. Yeah, that's different. That's because we have. Yeah. That's because we have no water. Because we don't have water falling from sky anymore. And once again, you know who's partially at fault for this? Government. Smokey the Bear. Excuse me. By the way, there we go. that's a that's Mr. Dumber. He's not Smokey the Bear. He's Smokey Bear. There is no the. It's weird. We all add the, but he's not Smokey the Bear. He's Smokey, Smokey Bear. Bear. Whatever. I know it's Mandela effect. Anyway, but here's the thing about Smokey. What did Smokey always warn us about? Fire. Only you can prevent wildfires, right? And we're thinking, well, wildfires. There, we want to prevent them because wildfires equal what? Bad. Bad. Yeah. But guess what? Wildfires don't always equal bad. Oh, They're yeah. part of nature. Right. So when you know what happened, we just let the, tr the trees keep growing and growing and growing, and then all of a sudden it stops raining, so they all turn out withering and stuff, and now all of a sudden, you know, it gets a little too hot, and some <clears throat> there we go, California's on fire. <laughs> Stink it, Smokey. Anyway. We have a whole season. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's the only season we have in California. Are things on fire, or are they not? <laughs> We haven't had a snow day here in years, but in, in the last five years, we had a smoke day, all right? You know? yeah, right. Which sounds really funny, actually. It's like, yeah, light up. And it's like, no, not that. Yeah, they, 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 they yes, we had retreat Thanksgiving week. Yes, that was 2016. But I digress. Um, there are some events, but it's during this time, too, you all see the Environmental Protection Agency has started, Earth Day has started. Uh, Rachel, I forget her last name, Carson, I think, right? Silent Springs, really bring attention to pesticide. Hey, you know what's so fun about the 70s too? It was violent. Oh, yeah. Terrorism is on the rise. Yeah, yeah. In 1972, there on the left, anyone know what that's from? Uh, 
No. Uh, it was a terrible person. Wait. Yeah, the Munich Olympics. Very good. The Munich Olympics, that's when the, um, the Palestinian terrorists stormed the Olympic Village, killed the 11 Israeli athletes. Uh, it's in the 70s. You have hijacking becomes this new craze. Everyone starts hijacking planes. You know, and all of a sudden now, if you see your friend Jack on a plane, you can't yell hi to him because now they have bust you. Because you go, hi, Jack, and everyone gets a little touchy now. Um, point, of, point, of, point of fact, actually, this is one of the reasons why 9-11 happens. Because during 9-11, they did what they were supposed to do. If your plane was hijacked, you just kind of go with it. Because traditionally, what they would do is they would then fly you somewhere, get a ransom, ransom paid, they let the people go. The 9-11, all of a sudden, they did something very different. But you've got terrorism on the rise. You've got the you've got Jim Jones in the People's oh, okay. Temple, where his you know this cult leader leaves. You know, Nine hundred eighteen people are killed down in Jonestown. Also, a member of Congress goes down there to find out what happened. So people tell him, "Yeah, we want to get the heck out of here. This guy's crazy." And they kill the congressman on the airport. Most people don't know about that one. I mean, most people, a lot of people do. Uh, this, but yeah, people are commit suicide in mass number or are murdered. Um, with, with they make them drink uh, flavor aid, not Kool Aid. Leave Kool-Aid out of this. Kool-Aid did nothing wrong. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, Jimmy was like, now it's time for us to die. How are we going to do this? <clears throat> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Good to work. You know, it wasn't like that or something. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, uh, 70 people were at least injected with poison. At least 304 of the victims were minors. But, yeah, this massive death. You know what's also fun about the 70s? Serial killers. Serial killers galore in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. This was the time period when most... This is like most podcasts are just talking about the seventies, or late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. When did Black Dahlia happen? Is this that? Uh, that was forties, actually. Okay. Yeah. So she was early. But yeah, the Manson family. You've got Son of Sam murdering people, not because he's a male worker, which may be part of it, but because dogs are telling him to do it because he's Satan's kid, according to him. What? Or was it him? You've got John Wayne Gacy, everyone's least favorite clown. You've got you got Tweaky from the Manson family trying to shoot President Ford. You got the Zodiac Killer who may still be out there. Who knows? And it, and actually, don't be fine. It's Ted Cruz. Don't worry. Anyway, that's not Ted Cruz. You've got you know Ted Bundy who's kind of good looking, but yet at the same time might murder you in your sleep. So yeah. By the way, by the way, remember this. Whenever your grandparents are like, ow, what's with you young people not picking up the phone or answering the door? <laughs> when you're back in their day, oh, you kept the door unlocked back when I was a kid, and look what happened. Serial <laughs> killers everywhere. So, yeah. So, yeah. Remember that. They're like, oh, the 70s, I just answered the phone. Why don't you just answer the phone? Why don't you just answer the door? Because back then you all kept getting slaughtered. All right? My grandparents had to drive away once from the Hollywood Strangler. All right? They were pulled over, and I'm not going to ask what they were doing pulled over, but whatever. And then they saw a guy get out of the car around that time with the Hollywood Strangler was popular, and they got the car out of there, and then yeah, someone got murdered the next day in that same area. So, yeah. 70s are violent and scary. All right? Look at that. Pop culture? Pet rocks are a thing. Some dumb, brilliant genius makes a million of dollars by putting rocks in a box. And people bought it. Yes, no, I, 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 I salute this man, you know. This goes along with the guy who put the pictures in the uh, chamber pots in the Civil War. You know, people are being, were into CB radios, you know. They were, uh, you know, bell bottoms were a thing. Have you seen that? You know what? I'm not a Dodger fan, but I give a lot of kudos to the Dodgers and the Yankees because they resisted the urge. Because the, have you seen the baseball uniforms from the 70s? Yeah. They are ugly. The Padres wore shorts for a while. They wore shorts. And this is the 70s, man. You remember what basketball shorts were like in the 70s? Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, the Angels, I, I love the Angels, you know, but their uniforms were like, they had that, they had that weird little A and like that. It was weird. I kind of like it. But still, it's weird. Yeah. Uh, TV was, uh, grown, in terms of pop culture, TV was kind of changing up. Very much a reflection of the times. You know, you had Charlie's Angels, right, which is about, which reflects what in the 70s? Woman. Yeah, woman, feminism, right? Same thing, the Mary Tyler Moore show. It wasn't about her being married. She lived in, she had a job in Minneapolis. And, and we know what the name, what was the theme song of her show? You're gonna make it on your own. That's the whole point. She don't need no man. 
he's a single woman in the 70s doing a job. You saw the rise of African American sitcoms, like Good Times. So then it turned into J.J. Walker. But early on, it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, like, Good Times. Get in the bus water. Temporary layoffs. Good times. They have good times, you know? You've got, you know, the family's actually pretty funny. It's, it's unique. It's like sitcoms were becoming big. But you can think about it, too. Were things great in the 70s? No. No. So you had a whole show talking about the 50s, and it was called what? No, oh, what was that show? No, no, I hate Happy Days. Oh, really? People looking back to the 50s as? Okay. Happy Days because now sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They had the Brady Bunch. Let's not, let's not go there. All right. Now, the 70s had some great movies. 50 years ago this week, Godfather came out. Probably the greatest yeah. of all time. You have Star Wars late 70s. Jaws by Steven Spielberg. He births. Steven Spielberg is partially responsible for summer as we know it. Because it, until Jaws came out, the summertime wasn't a time for movies. He invents the summer blockbuster. The big movie to get people in the theaters. Rocky. You've got Rocky, 1976. You know, Rocky makes me cry. All right? I'm a grown enough man to say I could cry at Rocky. Why not? It's a great movie. Especially the first one. The other one's got kind of ridiculous. The first one's amazing. You know? It's not about winning. It's about going the distance. Yeah. What else we got? So the movies were okay, but there's also a lot of weird movies in the 70s, too. There's a lot of weird movies in the 70s. There ain't me wrong. There's a lot of weird movies. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, we'll just say. A mixed bag. All right. Yeah. Gremlins? Is that what I heard? That's 80s. Gremlins is a good movie. That's 80s. Uh, 80s are a different time, too. My mom lied to me. I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure it's 83 or 84. What else we got going on? But yeah. So yeah, you got the music at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Back when Michael was black, you know, good times. Yeah, come on, the Jackson 5. Michael, Jermaine, Tito, Randy, and other ones. You know, it was a good time in the 70s. You got pop. The music could be okay at times. Yeah, you got Zeppelin. Yeah, I mean, come on. Who doesn't love, let's see. Go on, the opening number of Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song. Yeah. That's, everyone likes that. <laughs> you broke it there. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. It's like that. Every guitarist does this, right? <laughs> so they're sick of it. <laughs> just do it yeah, over and over again. But yeah, the birth of early hard rock. Um, you've got, like I said, you got pop. Um, early, you've got early um, punk starting. You can see, you can think of a, what's his name? Uh, Sid Vicious, right? And Nancy. God save the queen. Still written at this time. What's that? Is this the time where like people would like split around crowds and run at each other? Oh yeah, it's good times. Good times <laughs> <that's> the <two. laughs> No, we uh, that was we used to have a we had what's called Friday Forum at Brethren when I was in high school. And uh, we used to have Friday Forum. It was like this early Friday. We had this big like day where we had a speaker and like musicians. They had a Christian punk band. They turned into a mosh pit. They all got in trouble. That, that, that was punk. They would run and run. But yeah, you also had the soft, you had the wuss rock of the 70s as well. I mean, who doesn't like Piano Man? Everyone loves Piano Man, right? Yeah. Or heck, you've got, for those of you who like David Bowie, you've got, you've got Starman. And those of you who don't like David Bowie, but you still like spaceships, you've got Rocket Man. You've got all you want in the 70s, right? But don't forget, there was also something really problematic with the 70s as well when it came to music. Something very bad was also happening. Don't forget, this is the 70s. We were all cursed with this. That's right, late 70s, God knows what happened. But we lost our collective mind society and thought this was good dancing. Bunch of white people. In 1976, too, something happened amongst the white people. I don't know what it was.
because I this is why I lose my white man card. But white people instantly, somehow in the water, learn to do the electric slide without being told. <laughs> the music starts. They just walk up any wedding. You know, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But white people are good at it. It's that's their thing. Bam. Ah, uh, the '70s. That one, ladies. That was really hot. Yeah, I know, but still. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that guy's cute. Yeah, that guy's a pop. All right. The rest of them, I would like they're on cocaine. <laughs> we're probably all, we're probably. I mean, you're probably all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right, let's talk about our next president, Gerald Ford. Now, Gerald Ford's in a unique position. How did he become president? I don't know. Someone died because of Nixon. That's right, because, uh, but remember, how, he, okay, Nixon was. Nixon ran for president in 72. Who was his vice president? Anyone remember? I have no idea. Didn't he fire the other president? No. Spiro Agnew, right? He resigned. He resigned. And then who, he made him president, or vice president, right? <coughs> what happens to Nixon? Nixon resigns. Ford becomes the 38th, 38th president of the United States and never faced election. Because remember, he was appointed vice president. And one of the first things he does is super controversial. On September 8th, 1974, a, day, a month of the day after Nixon resigns, he goes on TV and he pardons Richard Nixon. He says, our long national nightmare is over. And this guy had been a member of, and he's been in Congress since 1948. Remember when Truman was president, when he was a young member of Congress. Um, and he did this. Now this one is super, super controversial. Because to Ford's credit, on one hand, he knew this was political suicide. Because he knew people would say, what are you doing? This is so wrong. They, would, they, they started saying, he must be in on it. Because look how he became president. They're like, see, he probably knew about it. Probably a backroom deal with Nixon, which it wasn't. Nixon actually never thanked him for this, ever. Nixon never thanked him for the pardon. But that's saying Ford pardoned Nixon of any crime he committed while president. He did it, though, because he thought this was for the good of the country. He thought the country did not need to see the President of the United States in an orange jumpsuit going to trial. But at the same time, you're going to see the other side. It's like, yeah, but now you're just establishing the precedent, which is kind of the case. If you're president, do you ever have to worry about doing anything wrong? No, you really don't have to. Because ultimately, you're kind of above the law, which that kind of undermines the whole you know, system. Um, of America. So it, it, I go back and forth on this one because I get where Ford was coming from and it was selfless. He knew it was going to hurt him. We won't go too much into the Ford presidency. It's a pretty short one. Um, here you can see this is what he did a lot. Yeah, he fell down, coming down the stairs. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else? During his presidency, uh, the Vietnam War ends. You see he meets with uh, Brezhnev. What was Brezhnev having? One thing he does that's pretty cool is on his own, he testifies before Congress on the pardoning of Nixon. Because Congress wants to look into it and know, okay, did you pardon him because he, there was like a backroom deal or not? And without being forced to, he does it. Yes, I will volunteer. This big moment, you guys know how the president always goes, the State of the, U the, State of the Union address, I always go, the State of the Union is strong. The State of the Union is good. Because the American people, this State of the Union is strong, right? Presidents always do that, right? He goes up there and goes, in 1948, a freshman congressman from Michigan sat in this room and listened to President Harry Truman give the State of the Union. And he remembers him saying that the State of the Union is good. So he's talking about himself when he was a young man. I'm here to tell you today, the State of the Union is not good. That's how bad the 70s were. The President of the United States, America's cheerleader is like, yeah, this ain't good, guys. Um, uh, two attempts on his life, assassination attempts, twice. Uh, one within like a month. One of them by the Manson family because that's what they did. Um, what else happened? Uh, by the way, president has the right to pardon anyone of any federal crime. That's getting back that pardoning of president. Yeah, yeah, when you don't care anymore. Federal crime though. So if you get like you know you can't go to the president for like you know a, a, for like a speeding ticket or for your. Uh, for your um, your detention, oh. I guess that's like Pastor Josh can pardon you, and the governor can pardon you in the state life, though. Yeah. So, uh, this, this, this kind of, it's kind of off topic, but which which president was the one that was like wish me when the balloon popped and it was like but, out? Oh, it was, uh, oh, that was Reagan. Reagan, Reagan. Yeah. Okay. Just, uh, 
Um, another thing you'll, you'll see up there demonstrates kind of the conservatism of the era. Nick, uh, for it starts the win or whip inflation now. And the idea was, how can we stop inflation if people will do what it takes to help? In other words, this is conservative because it's not saying the government's going to do anything. It's calling upon people to volunteer. And it did work. Inflation dropped from 12% to 5%, but then it went right back up. Um, he, tried to cut, he tried to cut spending, etc. So he comes to the election in 1976. Um, and it's Carter versus Ford, but also versus Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan does something un unique, and he runs against the sitting president, which most people don't do. Well, in the end, Ford will get the nomination. And like I said, the Democrats nominate this man, Jim Ikata. We'll talk about Jim Ikata in a minute. But there you can see, um, there, you go, there you go, don't sell peanuts like Ford, Carter for service. Mm -hmm. um, that was the idea. It's like, yeah, there will be a Ford in the White House, and I'm going to drive it. Yeah. Why is a uh, Republican elephant? Uh, in 1870-something, Thomas Nass drew a cartoon of, a, of an elephant. I can't remember the exact setting, and then it stuck. So they've been elephants ever since. But yeah, the election of 76, uh, you have this famous moment where Gerald Ford goes on, you know, there is no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, and there never will be as long as I'm president. What's the problem with that statement? Uh, yeah, the Soviets have been dominating Eastern Europe for about 40 years at that point. Even the moderator is like, um, excuse me, Mr. President, I'm going to ask you again, like, so you're saying the Soviets don't dominate as their sphere of influence? It's like, well, I don't think the Yugoslavians would think that. And he, afterwards, he meant to more say, I would not be okay with that, but it just looked so out of touch. You know, they'd be like, the sky is not blue as long as I'm president. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it is. Unless California's on fire, then don't worry about it. But yeah, he just looked bad. So in 76, the election happens. And Jim Ikata becomes the 39th president of these states united. So there we go. It's my Jim Ikata. Um, the colors are swapped, by the way, to get used to it. But yeah, Carter wins. Not overwhelmingly. It's a decent amount. But he, he does win. Becomes the 39th president. So let's talk about our friend Jimmy James. Who's still alive. Our oldest surviving president. He's like 95. He's still he's still doing good. <laughs> Everybody loves Jimmy Carter, right? Now, Jimmy Carter is a good example of, the, of what we call the effect of the, the, the um, Watergate scandal. Because here's the thing. What, Nixon was very insider. So was a lot of these guys. And the idea, people said, we need someone from outside the beltway, as it's called. We want a Washington outsider. And this begins America's kind of desire. You don't get to come here late and do things like that. Anyway, um, this begins America's love affair of electing the outsider. You know, that's the thing unique about politics. Only in politics does that matter. Because could you imagine, you know, why should I let you fix the plumbing in my house? Because I'm not a plumber. I'm not part of the plumbing elite. I have fresh ideas how to fix your toilet. Is that how Trump became president? Uh, yeah, actually, yes. That's the road to that. Same thing. Why should you do open heart surgery on me? I'm not a doctor. I'm not part of the MA, AMA and the medical establishment that want to confine you to ideas. <laughs> well, saw me open. But why should you be president? Because I'm not a politician. I'm not part of the Washington inside. I have fresh ideas on how we can help this country. And people love it. And that was the thing about Carter. Carter was not Nixon. He was a more, and once again, he's also a more conservative Democrat. He's from Georgia. He was the governor of Georgia. He helped kind of inspire the Georgia film industry. If you ever watch, a lot of TV shows and movies are filmed in Georgia. And it starts kind of with Carter, um, which has a California. Like, how dare you take my stuff? But he was an outsider. He was a Southern Baptist, and he called himself born-again Christian. By the way, I'm not denying that he is. I'm just saying he used the term when I say he called himself. Just FYI. Um... He was a man that could get other parties. I mean, he was moderate. I mean, here he is meeting with Henry Aaron because Hank Aaron was a member of the Atlanta Braves. But he was the Christian outsider. He was the honest man. In other words, he was not Nixon. Whereas Nixon was corrupt, expletive deleted, and insider, this guy is honest outsider. For heaven's sakes, the man did and continues to lead a Bible study, a Sunday school. All right, the guy still dedicates one month out of a, one whole weekend out of the year to build homes for Habitat for Humanity. 
other one loves Jimmy Carter. The guy, he just survived skin cancer of the brain like three years ago too, so good for him. Which, it's the skin of the brain has cancer. It's not this brain cells themselves that have the cancer, but the skin cells on the brain. But yeah, so he's the reason, he gets elected with this because people see him as, even people, like I can think of my mom. My mom's a Republican, you know, voted Republican a lot in her life. She voted for Carter. She wanted that fresh air. Um, and so he gets elected, he, he gives a pretty nice speech for being a pretty Christian leader, he doesn't overuse the Bible. And I don't mean that in a bad way, like overuse the Bible, like the Bible's a bad thing. But you can tell when someone's using the Bible a lot to use the Bible. You know, they want to use it to like, look at me, look how Bible-y I am. He quotes one scripture, you know. We seek to do, as was reported in the book of Isaiah, to seek justice and let it roll down like running water. So, you know, that, you know, walk humbly before your God. Famous one there, you see, after he gets sworn in, he walks to the White House. He doesn't take the presidential limo. He does like, um, uh, what's his name? What's his name? Uh, <laughs> it's called, what? That's dangerous. It's considered. Yeah, now it'd be, well, they still do it. Um, uh, Biden did it. So, um, yeah, I'm surprised he made it that far. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like he's barely alive. Oh, he's fine. Dude, the guy rides like a bike like 10 I miles a day. I think he's really? good. Yeah, he rides. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. He's not a he's not a diet coke swilling cheeseburger loving former president who happened to be uh, as physical one pound under obese you know oh. by a miracle. It's like that's a lot of steps down there. So um, dude was a jolly rancher away from obese. But, uh, but yeah, he walks there like uh, what's his name at that? What's his name did that? Um, Jefferson did the same thing. The idea of simplicity bring it back. Carter is probably one, you know, once one of the things, they said Carter is probably like our first post-Cold War president. Problem is the Cold War was still going on and he's gonna have a lot of problems having during his presidency. One of the early things he does that's really like controversial is he gives a blanket pardon and a, or an amnesty to anyone who draft, who was a Vietnam War draft dodger. If they didn't, if they evaded the draft, he gave them a blanket pardon. And the idea was, okay, the Vietnam War is behind us because now, you know, Vietnam fell about almost two years after, before this. Let's put the Vietnam War behind us. Let's just end it all, bring all our Americans home who are like maybe still in Canada. Let's put it behind us. Once again, controversial. On one hand, you get the idea. Let's put the bad thing behind us. That was Ford's mentality with Nixon. On the other hand, for others, it's like, oh, that's great. I didn't draft dodge the draft. I went to Vietnam and it was not pleasant. Great. All right, what happened in the 70s? Well, uh, the, there were, was, under Carter, you saw attempts. Ah, I had a good run. I had a good run. Um, at uh, energy reform, which they were in desperate need of. There we go. Like I said, you had the energy crisis of the 70s. During this time, the Department of, the Ener of Energy is created as part of the American cabinet level position. Um, they also in charge of our nuclear supply. But yeah, this also, uh, they were going to raise taxes on gasoline. Pretty much they were trying to move cars away from the gas-guzzling, macho muscle cars of the 70s. Especially in 79, there's a further fuel shortage. I'm sorry. Um, this also created the super fund. It was known for cleaning up chemical waste dumps. Um, it also protected much, like 100 million acres of Alaska from uh, development. But you also have Three Mile Island and Skint. Other domestic reforms, like I said, he, he gave amnesty to uh, 10,000 draft dodgers. He, uh, the Department of Education was created at this time, the way to start having more of a national approach to education. Um, you saw the civil service was more based on a merit system, less on an exam, but still, once again, people getting hired. But yeah, it was a unique point. Uh, Carter was very moderate. Like see, he's not a very liberal Democrat, which shows that the pendulum of America is starting to swing to the right. He's a more conservative Democrat. But during Carter's presidency, stagflation continued. The economy still was not good. Um, even though he convinced Congress to pass a tax cut, he's cutting taxes, hoping that would help. It still didn't help. Um, interest rates are inflation is high. Interest rates start to soar. Here's the thing. Right now, like you can buy a house with like three to five, at most five percent interest. Okay, probably somewhere in the three range. Okay, you buy a house with three some odd percent interest because rates are low. In the 1970s, early 1980s, 12 to 20 percent interest rate. Yeah, interest rates were through the roof. But the idea is you keep interest rates high. The hope is that will help inflation because people are spending less money. They're saving it or they can't put it out. Did not work. Unemployment was on the rise. 
Overall, it was the 70s, and everyone was miserable. So you have this famous moment in 1979 at Camp David. Jimmy Carter calls together um, leaders from across the country to talk to them. Tell me about how things are in America. What's the spirit of America like right now? And they tell him that, yeah, everything's, there's a, there's things are bad. And he gives his famous crisis of confidence speech. I'm not going to worry about playing it here. Maybe I will later. And he talks about it. And he's saying Americans are experiencing a crisis of confidence in the United States. Where we used to worship God and we used to worship, you know, we thought about things higher and family values. Now we worship the almighty dollar and we worship stuff. And at first... The speech at first, a lot of Americans kind of liked it. It was given positive reviews. He was saying, like, look, if we want to fix things in here, we need to get back to what matters. We need to not worry about buying stuff. Um, he said, in a nation that was proud of hard work, strong families, close-knit communities, and our faith in God, too many of us now tend to worship self-indulgence and consumption. Later said, this intolerable, intolerable dependence on foreign oil threatens our economic independence and the very security of our nation. The energy crisis is real. Which he's right. The idea that when we de if America depends on oil from other countries, that's a security issue. You can look right now. Um, every act of energy conservation is like this is more than common sense. I tell you, it was an act of patriotism. So he's saying if you save energy, you're not just doing something that makes sense because it saves you money. You're being a good American. Like I said, Americans liked it at first, but then the media tore him apart. They called it the National Malay Speech, saying, why was he, oh, the Sunday school teacher's back, admonishing the children for not learning their lessons. It's like, that's not his job. His job's not to wag the finger at America. Um, and they started to drag him down with it. This is not the media of JFK today, where they would have loved it. Um, they're like, all he's doing is blaming America. He's not offering solutions. And that one really hurt him in the end. You had a decent point, but this is America. You know, the president's job is to be a cheerleader, not tell people, hey, we need to change our ways. Uh, in terms of his foreign policy, we're going to look at the Cold War later, after probably after, maybe before spring break, but at least later. Um, he, taught, he started emphasizing human rights as a part of America's political um, foreign policy, which once, you know, he's one of the things that at a speech at Notre Dame. He said, for so long, we've tried to fight fire with fire. Realizing that maybe fire would be better fought with water. Unless it's from Ohio, then I'll just make the water, not make the fire worse, but you know, not talking talk about the Ohio water. But yeah, once again, this will become a part of American foreign policy after the Cold War. He's a little too early. Other things that happen um, during his presidency, you have negotiations over the Panama Canal. And the United States agrees to turn over the Panama Canal to Panama by 1999, uh, which it does. Um, believing it was only right. Very divisive, very controversial to this day. The greatest success of Carter's administration, though, was the Camp David Accords. In 1977, um, at Camp David, which is the presidential retreat in Maryland, he invites um, Nachman Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel, and uh, um, Anwar Sadat, the President of Egypt, to Camp David to work out some kind of peace accord. This is a big moment, um, and it's only, it took these three people are the key figures. It couldn't happen without Begin, it couldn't happen without Carter, and it couldn't happen without Sadat. Any other Egyptian leader, Israeli leader, or maybe American leader could not have made this happen. Um, it was a big moment, and you can see the first time, this even right here, when they first get there, the fact that the president of Egypt and the prime minister of Israel are starting to talk. Because at this point, all these the Arab nations have denied Israel has a right to exist. Um, and it's a big meeting. And here you can see various figures. There's one like Menachem Begin. Oh, man. That's the Secretary of Defense of Israel. And that's who you want in charge of the defense of your country, don't you? I mean, come on. How many of you would sleep well at night knowing that guy's in charge of keeping your country safe? Yeah, like, look at him. Just awesome looking. But there you can see. Um, the United States, this is one of its first major involvements. For 12 days, they were there. No media whatsoever. The idea is we're going to get away from the media. We're not going to worry about it. Um, the U.S. took on a role as a mediator, but tried not to be. Each side wanted the United States to be objective, but on their side. The United States tried to stay objective overall. But you can tell it's the 70s. Look at them shorts. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's the president of the United States wearing shorts and tube socks because it was 1979, and that's what you did. So, 
That's my, that wasn't my best card. I have a better card than that. He's got to do the lip thing because he's from Georgia. <laughs> by the way, if you saw that peanut earlier, because he was a peanut farmer, by the way, before he was governor of Georgia. Yeah. Just FYI. He was on TV too once. Um, but you can see this coming together. Let me, I'm going to play for you guys. I just love, 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 love this video um, from President Carter, him talking about what happened towards the end of it. And it's an amazing video. Let me, let me play. Let me get this ready for you guys. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Hold on, Mr. Carter. I just love this video where he talks about it. It's very moving. Okay, shh. Uh, wait a minute, what time is it? The last day. I, okay, we got, it's only a minute 40, so please, if the bell rings, wait. And we were getting ready to leave Camp David in Fager. And go back to Washington and announce that we had not been successful. Ah, forget it. I thought we had a couple minutes. I'll save it for next time. But this video is really neat. So they meet. His point is they thought they had failed. They're about to leave. What's going to happen? We'll find out tomorrow. So there you go. If you learn anything in this class, just get on your knees and thank God I did not live in the 70s.